Welcome to the December 2022 LA PPG meeting. It's our last meeting of the year. Oh my gosh, can't believe it. It's already December. Uh, if you hear anything in the background, I think it's my dog drinking, so I apologize for that. But it's, uh, it's so nice to have you all here. Thank you for being here with us tonight. It's later than usual. So all you East Coast people, we appreciate you uh, staying up and and uh, being with us. We are super excited um, to have this, uh, the folks from Cinema Audio Society with us tonight. Uh, that's pretty special for us. Um, we are gonna be discussing team versus single mixer projects, and we have an award-winning panel for you tonight. So I'm going to welcome our moderator. I feel so lucky and honored that um, we have Carol Urban joining us tonight. Um, Carol is a re-recording mixer for television and feature films. She's an involved member of the community and served as board member for the Cinema Audio Society before being elected as president of the organization in 2019. She enjoys educational outreach and has moderated and appeared on panels for Mixes Sound for Film event, MPSE, and Sound Girls. And some of her credits include Big Sky, New Girl, Grey's Anatomy, Outlander, and The Stand. I love that. Um, so welcome, Carol. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. There she is. Oh, my gosh. Hello. I have to thank you for putting together this incredible award-winning panel for us. Um, it's just, I, I said, you know, we, we have this idea and you came up with some great ideas on, on your own. And then to pull together all these amazing people, it's just, you, you rock, girl. So thank you so much. And I'm going to let you run with it so we can get to it. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you so much, Woody, and thank you, LAPPG, and everybody who's joining us today. And also, um, thank the CIS, because honestly, I threw this to my Vince committee, and uh, they came up with all those really cool ideas. And uh, <laughs> and they, uh, uh, they volunteered, and we have a really, you're right, Wendy, we have a lovely panel. All right. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, um, I'm going to just introduce myself a little bit. Um, Carol Urban, uh, CAS, MPSE, and uh, I am a re-recording mixer as well. Uh, and I am the current president for the CAS, and I just like to talk about the CAS for a really small amount of time because I know we don't have a lot of time tonight, and we do have an excellent panel. Um, we are the largest group of professional audio mixers in the world. We have members in every continent except Antarctica. So Antarctica, if you're watching. Um, or listening, rather. Um, we represent production mixers, Foley mixers, Scory mixers, ADR mixers, and re-recording mixers. And we serve the community, and it's all about audio over here. It's all about sound for film. Um, we are currently um, in the process of beginning our uh, plans. Actually, we're in the middle of our plans and craziness for the fabulous CAS Awards, the 59th CAS Awards, which will occur this year on March 4th. Uh, we'll be honoring production mixer Peter J. Devlin, CAS, of which um, Woody and uh, Wendy Woodhall and LAPPG did a wonderful spread on their webpage. So you want to check that out. And we're also going to be honoring uh, filmmaker Alejandro Gonzalez Enaritu, which is super fancy and awesome. So um, yay, CAS. It's really, really lovely. And all of our panelists are CAS members uh, today. Um, so let's get to uh, let's get to this panel. We're really honored to present tonight. Um, we're going to do a comparative, uh, comparative discussion on workflow and uh, the social dynamics as it relates to mixing alone in a post-audio environment or as part of a mixed team on a dub stage. So, um, you know, both carry the same mission, um, but there are advantages and disadvantages for the mixer, the project, and the client in these different workflows. So I'm going to screen share here. So we can really take a look at this is what we do. This is what we do is re-recording mixers. And that chart, all those things that come at us to make the final dub and final mix, that doesn't change um, whether there's uh, a single mixer, uh, maybe even a mixer editor, mixer sound editor, um, or uh, whether we have a team um, of uh, with, a, with a number of mixers and uh, perhaps a music editor and a sound supervisor and a mixed tech. And, uh, but the mission is the same. So let me introduce my panel as we uh, discuss um, how we, uh, all of us individually, have worked in a team or um, as individual mixers and how that how that changed 
Um, so moving first to uh, Bob Bronow, CAS. Um, he's a re-recording mixer, works in television, uh, film and radio for more than 30 years. He's got uh, three primetime Emmy Awards, four uh, CAS uh, award wins, and two MPSC Golden Reels, many of which for his work as a single mixer on The Deadliest Catch, which is fantastic. Uh, he currently serves uh, on um, the Cinema Audio Society's Board of Directors. Uh, and uh, one another wonderful credit of his is Cruel Summer, which is excellent. He does quite a bit of scripted mixing now in a team environment, so he'll be lovely to shed some light. Uh, come on in. Come on screen, my friend Bob. Hey, Bob. Thank hey, you for joining. Hi, Carol. <laughs> Excellent. Um, moving uh, forward, we have uh, Sean Cunningham, CAS. He's also a re-recording mixer. He specializes in animation. Um, he's graduated of Berkeley uh, College of Music. Uh, he began his career uh, mixing music and uh, made his way into post-production. So that uh, certainly has different workflows. Um, he is currently the re-recording mixer for Family Guy and American Dad. Say hello, Sean. Sean, where are you, my friend? There he is. <laughs> How are you? Excellent. Uh, moving forward, we have Jonathan Wales, CAS. Um, he's actually from London, from across the pond. Uh, he works uh, as a re-recording mixer uh, here in Los Angeles now. Uh, he's working at Universal Studios. Uh, he's got a, a real passion for the sound and technology. He does a lot of work with Avid as well. Um, and uh, he led a facility, he's owned a facility as well, Sonic Magic. Um, he's uh, then moved to Warner Brothers. He's Makes just about everything. I love his work in the in the suspense and horror genre. Um, welcome, Jonathan Wales, mixer of Get Out, uh, The Black Phone, uh, Midnight Mass. Yeah, really excellent. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for uh, you know, joining us. Excellent. And uh, finally, uh, we have uh, Matt Waters, our final panelist. Uh, Matt Waters, CAS, is a six-time Emmy winner and six-time CAS winner. He's a re-recording mixer as well. Um, also mixes a ton of different genres and different formats. Um, some of his notable credits, of which there are many, are uh, Game of Thrones and Only Murders in the Building. How you doing, Matt? Hey, yay! <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, start our discussion here. Um, how do, and I'm just going to ask the uh, the panel in general, um, how, from your perspective, uh, do you feel when you sit down uh, as an individual mixer versus a team mixer, what about both of those workflows excites you? So positive things, what excites you about a single mixer and a team mixer workflow? Oh, come on. One of you guys has to start. Oh, Bob, I think you just got it, man. That okay, fine. Now. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Um, well, when I'm mixing alone as a single mixer, I basically I sit down with an idea in my head of what I'm trying to accomplish. I know all the elements that I've got, and hopefully they've all downloaded and they're all been imported into my session properly. Otherwise, I get to fire myself. Uh, when I'm working <laughs> on a stage, uh, it's a different kind of excitement because there's a whole group there. And basically, everybody kind of has to agree that, OK, let's start this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we go. So they're they're both exciting in different ways. How about you, Sean? You've done quite a bit of have you done animation as a team mixer and a single mixer? I have, and I've done animation in it as a team side by side, but then also sort of in an odd way, um, mixing and then handing off to another mixer, not at a facility, but um, we're in different rooms working on this sort of the same thing. So um, it's, a, yeah, like Bob said, it's exciting because when you're a solo, you're, you're sitting there thinking in your head, how am I going to you know sculpt this and, and what do I want to do with this mix? Um, with a team, it's it's more fun because you know you have someone to talk to and and uh, bounce your ideas off with um, to get started on the mix. Um, plus, it's a lot easier when you're with clients and you're getting lots of notes to you know get get up and get yourself a cup of coffee for a minute while your mixing partner does a lot of work. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely definitely benefits to to both workflows, and it really depends on on the project and the clients really that kind of dictate whether. Uh, a solo or or a team is the best option. Excellent. And uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, you did not do Midnight Mass as a single mixer. He was telling me this before we started the panel tonight. Did you really? Uh, uh, yeah, 
I really did. Um, that was an incredibly complex mix. That's amazing. <laughs> well, and, and I think I think part of it is is that you know working single mix on something like that, it got to have longer, because mm-hmm. uh, you know it's like it slightly changed the cost equation for people with the work from home, uh, you know, pandemic situation, um, and and so we were able to trade up. You know, like, well, it was originally budgeted for this amount of time in a big in a big stage, but now I'm doing it at home and it and it's me. So so we were able to trade up and get more time. I think as a in single mix a situation, you're leaning more on the the editorial, you know, sound supervisors, music editors, um, creatively. Uh, I found myself, you know, like I would do stuff and then I would get people on Evercast you know, like Snacky, the music editor or whatever. And I'd be like, dude, is this any good? You know, there was, there was a, there was a lot of that as you're sort of trying to find yourself and trying to figure out which things work, especially with shows that are somewhat experimental like that. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that's very different. I've actually done like three different methodologies relatively close together. I did, you know, Midnight Mass and Midnight Club were both single mixer here. I did Echoes for Brian Yorkie where I was working with David Rains, but we worked, we did two days each separately and then we came together for two days. Um, So we both worked at home for the first two days and then we came together and that was an interesting way of doing it. Uh, And then obviously, uh, you know, when we did like Doctor Sleep, that was full giant stage, me and Mike Babcock. Uh, you know, working the traditional way where everything's in the room, everybody's in the room together and you're just bouncing off. So it's, it's just a very different way of being creative. And uh, I don't think one's better than the other. I just think like like so many things, it's just different. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And Matt, you have like a, you, you can do anything, but you have a, a special talent in my, in my mind as a, as a, uh, a mixer of sound design and a mixer of sound effects. Do you also have the the situation uh, that Jonathan does when you're mixing a, as a single mixer, where you're kind of like, "Ooh, let me run this by somebody." Like, how how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, I like working with another person in the sense that if I create an offstage uh, sound design, uh, I know what it is, so it obviously works for me because I created it. But uh, I love it when I'm mixing and, and I'm mixing with somebody and they look over at me and go, what's that? I'm like, oh, crap, that didn't work. Okay, got it. <laughs> if, if, if they can't track it, no one can. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, that, that is the one benefit amongst many of uh, mixing with a partner is, um, you know, you do get to bounce ideas off one another and then the creative juices just can flow. I mean, there's a lot of times where I'll be mixing and I'll do something and I'll look over, I'm like, is this working? You know, kind of like John mm-hmm. said. And, uh, and then I love it when my mixing partner goes, no, this is not working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, okay, good point. Good point. Thanks. I'll retract. Mm-hmm. So it's fun. I often find, um, I don't know if this happens to you guys as well, but I often find, especially when I'm working on ADR, that you can hone in on kind of this section that doesn't match and you can kind of, you lose, or even in noise reduction, you can lose sight of the forest for the trees. You know what I mean? You can work on something so specifically that you lose the overall as it's sitting well in the whole picture. Do you, how do you handle that as, as individual mixers? I mean, I, I work in long chunks. So I, I'll go in and, and then I'll tweak a little bit, but then I'll just go back and do the whole scene. I, I hate doing, I, I, never, I never loop, I, I, hate, I hate it. Because you're comparing it to itself. And so like you say, you just get un, unmoored yeah. from, from reality yeah. very quickly. Um, so I mean, that's my personal thing. And then the other one is, is, is tomorrow. In other words, quite literally, does it still work tomorrow? That is a very good point. I love a Friday at you on Monday dub, right? Because you get enough perspective that you're not, it's even fresh. You're enjoying watching the show again on Monday. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things I found in the pandemic was I got to work out of order. We could do anything we liked. We had a start date and we had an end date and nobody cared what happened in between. And, um, you know, so I could just do an episode, put it down, do a different episode, Put, go backwards and forwards. And that was really good also for getting some continuity to it. Hmm. And you know, another, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I was, I was about to go to you, Bob, actually. Yeah, oh, good, perfect. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, working as a single mixer, one of the nice things that I like to do is 
is I like to keep the backgrounds up and a little bit of the music because I find when I don't, if I'm just like doing just a straight dialogue pre-dub, I will, I will way over, over process and over noise redu reduce and just spend way, way more time than I need to. And so even just having those things up a little bit is great. Now that's a different situation if you happen to be, uh, you know, working, say you're a dialogue mixer, then you got to look at your effects mixer and say, hey, can we link up for a minute? Um, or when I'm working as an effects mixer, uh, I will just link up to wherever the dialogue mixer, mixer happens to be working. And then I can start balancing stuff based on the dialogue that I'm hearing. And no one seems to get mad at me for that. <laughs> I, let's, I, uh, I agree. <laughs> let's actually think uh, in our experience about a project that you absolutely could not do as a single mixer and why. Yeah. American Soul. American Soul? Why? Why not American Soul? Because there, there was at least half of the show was music, like live music. Uh, I mean, there's music throughout, but, you know, there were live performances, there were in-studio performances, because the premise was about uh, Don Cornelius when he was starting uh, Soul Train. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so sometimes you'd be on the, in the studio, sometimes they'd be singing and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and it was really a fast three-day mix, but we got two days to do it. So basically, we mixed the whole show in a day. Uh, came back early the next morning, did our playback for ourselves, and then people started coming in for notes. And there's no way that could have been done with that kind of turnaround without having two people working full time. And when when I've been working with uh, Mark, we have a weird way of working that actually is his weird way of working, but I got into it, is we he's using the big picture on the big screen. I'm using little picture on my little screen. We're both playing on the mains. We may be at different places in the show, but we both can rock through it and it works. Excellent, excellent. And Matt, I come on, how could you, could you have done Game of Thrones as a single mixer? Is it possible? What do you think? It wouldn't have came out as well, I can yeah. tell you that. <laughs> um, I, think the, I think the reality is you can do anything as a single mixer, it's all about time. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I had mm -hmm. 60 days, I could probably get it close. But to be honest, and, and I'm, I actually am not being flippant when I say this, is it wouldn't have been as good. There's mm -hmm. no way, you know, for me, you know, I do mix single mixing stuff and I mix uh, uh, with two people. And even on Crazy Heart, uh, Rick Klein makes music while uh, we had a dialogue mixer and then I mixed effects. So I've, I've done a lot of different kinds. And the reality is, I think it, I think it, I personally think it really helps the project. And I kind of tell the mm -hmm. clients to have two mixers because everybody brings their sauce to the game, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if you have a, and also, you know, so like, I know it's less because of the pandemic, but you know, I've been around a long time and a lot of it is clients are there and you have to entertain them. You know, it, you're, it's yes. a show. And I can tell you right now, if you're just a single mixer and you've got X amount of time, you're just concentrating on the tracks. And there's nothing like when I'm concentrating on a tracks, so like you would entertain the clients here and they're, hey, what's going on? How's your day? Blah, 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or vice versa. And, um, you know, so, you know, I just, for me, I think the best is um, to have two mixers for sure mm -hmm. in that regard. And, and, and no joke, uh, some of the best stuff I've ever done wouldn't have been as good if it was just me. Mm -hmm. And I have a high regard for myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I spent the first 12 years of my career as exclusively a single mixer and as a sound designer, editor mixer as well. And I thought that when I went into a, a team environment, that it would actually cause me to have less of a relationship directly with the client. Like I wouldn't be as close with the client, but you're absolutely right, Matt. I found now that I work 
almost exclusively, well, not almost exclusively. I did a big show last summer that was all single mixer, but, but, it's, um, but mostly I work in a team and I do prefer it. And I, I find that the ability to run interference, you know, like you need to do something that's going to be annoying to the client and, you know, each pass are going to be like, no, no, no. And I'm like, I know, I know. I just need, I need like, give me, like, give me three passes. I need to, you know, you, know, <laughs> you need to, you need to focus or you need to go into the cone and, you know, focus on what it is that, you know, you're doing that thing with ADR where you're like, you know, what in this picture doesn't match, you know, so I'm like from A to B, you know, you need that space and you don't have to worry about disconnecting or uh, leaving the client in a limbo space because you have your, your partner to go, Hey, why don't we talk about what's going on in this scene over here? Or, Hey, you know, how did that, you know, football game go last weekend that you were telling me about, or how did like, you have that to, to kind of throw back and forth. And it also reduces fatigue doing notes as a single mixer like I used to feel so guilty in the bathroom because I shut down the stage you know what I mean I shut it down like there's no work happening right now and money's still happening and I'm in the bathroom you know so well, I, will, I will say that's that's actually uh, I don't want to take it the whole time but that's a great point when I do a single person mix I have become pretty disciplined it after two and a half mm -hmm. hours Okay, guys, I'm gonna take a break. We're gonna take five minutes. Yeah. I gotta get out of here. Um, I You're gotta... smart. And so, uh, but you know, I really find that you train the clients or the clients train you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mm -hmm. I'm being super serious when I say that. And it took me a long time to get there. And now, and, and then, you know, it's funny, the first time I did it and then I came back, they didn't leave, they're fine. Oh, hey, good to see you. Like, they get it. <laughs> like, they're not stupid. They just right, want right, you right. to stay there, but they're like, yeah, I get it. I would love to, you know? So uh, <laughs> anyway, so I think for everybody out there, if you're doing single person things, you know, stick up for yourself and get a breather. I mean, walk for the, the you know, get your step watch out. You know? <laughs> yeah, establish, yeah, establishing a rhythm with the client. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, there are some clients who you just can't do a single mix or a show with. They just have a personality that can't stop. And, and you know, those clients, you you should definitely not try and do that but um <laughs> otherwise like like what i said it, it's a it's a time thing overall um and we do we we establish a rapport with the clients and a rhythm with the clients and if the clients trust you on a single mixer thing then then that's what you're doing and if it's a, uh, you know if you get the luxury of being able to work in a team then then that's great Excellent. And, and Sean, would you say you, you work uh, with some funky workflows that aren't necessarily single mixer or team mixer, but tag team, which I, I did let that last summer myself. And that was very interesting. How do you how do you like that kind of hybrid space? It's really nice because it, it does give you, like Jonathan said, it gives you that luxury of do I like it tomorrow? Is it working tomorrow? You know, like you spend a whole day working on something and then you've sent it off and you're, you know, the mixer you're working with picks it up the next day and then they're either into it or go, what the hell are you thinking? Or, <laughs> you know, um, so it, it's, it's cool that, you know, it's, you get to spend a lot more time crafting and when you have the luxury of time to, to do those sorts of things, I think that workflow works really well and you can really be creative, um, w doing that sort of tag team way. But it, at the end though, there has to be um, obviously a meetup. It can't be 100% separate. So a lot of the things that I've done that way would be um, actually a bunch of documentaries where we sort of worked, you know, separately to, together. And then we we did a final like playback on a, on a big stage and um, seeing it all come together at once was was, you know, taught us a lot about the process the first time we did it and then the, the second and third times that we did it we kind of had a great leg up on it and 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 i think we made it that much better as we went through it so excellent yeah, yeah. And what about you bob did you get lonely working because you were you were like me you worked many many years consistently as a single mixer like i just missed people did you miss like having like an audio nerd buddy, I missed my buddy, you know? I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes, yes. I wouldn't say I missed people, but I did, I did have my, but the thing is, I was working in a place that had uh, three other rooms mm -hmm. that were also mixing. So uh, one of the other mixers and I had this thing, it was like the, the cool shortcut of the day. Mm -hmm. So every day we try to bring in some Pro Tool shortcut that the other one hasn't heard of yet. So that was our entertainment. Like a little game, yeah. And that sounds kind of pathetic when I hear myself saying 
<laughs> no, I'm always like the show and tell of what's the new plugin is always kind of really fun too. I like it. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah. uh, hypothetically, a client comes to you guys and they say, oh, you know, I've got say this, this indie film or this uh, documentary or this show. And um, I have come to you, Mixer. Um, how should I do this show? How should I set this show up? Um, I have parameters that I've not set out to you. What are your first questions to this individual to determine whether they should go in a team or a single mixer workflow? What are your questions when someone comes to you with a project? Like, how are you going to formulate your day as your first parameters? What's the deadline? <laughs> I mean, because ultimately that is yeah. question number yeah. one, right? How long do you have mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. all money aside, if they need it tomorrow morning, then that's a different, you're playing in a different playground than if it's mm -hmm. going to come out next year. Okay. And if they say, well, a couple months next year, like plenty of time, T uh, time is, what are parameters past that? I mean, I mean at some me, point it's got budget, right? Yeah. Just like Jonathan said, I mean, for me, it's, it's, a, I, I asked them point blank, how much money do you have? I, cause I can't answer any questions unless I know, what kind of money you have. And then I can help you get the best possible sound for your storytelling, for your film, if I know what monies you have to spend. Mm -hmm. I do often find that that's the case because there's concessions that you can make that, granted, you ideally don't want to make any concessions and you want to make the maximum, you know, fantastic project you can. But there are concessions that you can make that can help to cut initial budget requirements for maybe something that's being pitched or uh, something that's uh, going to festival or et cetera. Um, that, that's a good point. Excellent. Yeah, do mean, you guys? Oh, I just, sorry. I just, you know, I'm doing this Sundance film that got uh, into Sundance on the main thing and, you know, their budget is, is not large. And I just went through this conversation and, and, and an interesting thing, they didn't, their money was so little that in order to do it, we came up with the idea to go to South America and mix for a week. And so I'm going to go to Bogota for six days and do a mix there and then come back to L.A. and then go to an L.A. stage for three days. Sweet. You get to go to right? Bogota. But I, I yeah. guess the, po the, the, the <laughs> point is, the, the, the point, the point <laughs> is, no, this was a, this is a single person. <laughs> but the point is that it, it, it was it fascinated me in the sense that you can be worldwide now. Like it's, it, it is really a small universe out there. And, you know, so that was just interesting. Something new for me. And I've been doing this forever. The pandemic has changed that. It's, it's legitimized the concept of being able to work at least partially somewhere else. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we all have our situation um, you know, where we're doing some stuff at home and then we'll go get in a room. And, and as soon as the budget is challenged, that's the first thing you can leverage now to be able to, you know, basically put the money on screen because instead of spending the money to have the big room all the way through, you can spend some of the time focused in a less expensive environment and then hook up, mm -hmm. in, you know, in a, in a bigger room, but for less days. I've definitely um, used the um, the budget saving technique of I uh, will pre dub, you know, in my home space or in my home studio, and then move to a large dub stage. In fact, when I first came to LA, that was kind of the paradigm that I used to uh, get projects that could afford to go to the stages that I wanted to hire me, as I would just four wall there <laughs> and look awesome and try and like get them to hire me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. How about you, Bob? What are some things that you would tell a client who is budget uh, challenged? Well, first of all, like you said, um, I'll, I, and I'm still doing stuff all the time where I do day one here, day two on the stage with clients. I uh, did a short film a little while back and I did everything here. Uh, and we did a final playback at a proper mix stage. Uh, but the other thing I always ask my clients is at the, at the end of this, what do you want? What will you have and what will you do with it? Uh, you know, because it's one thing to mix something for television and it's another to mix something for theatrical. 
and then them saying, oh, I got to put this on YouTube and it's got to be at minus 18. You know, they're all all kind of different animals. So at least knowing going into it what it is that they want to leave with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how about you, Sean? What's your uh, advice? Somebody comes to you with the random uh, project and they well, go, say- sound mixer, what do I do? How can I get my project mixed? It, you know, it, it for me being in, in animation, it, it works a little bit more, especially, you know, mostly TV animation where, you know, doing a lot of stuff from home, and and actually, the, during the pandemic, I did a, a series from here, and we actually just streamed over Source Live and did all the mixed reviews that way, um, and and finalized them. And um, that I think that ability now is a great way to help clients with their budget. Um, and you know, like everyone else is saying, like do a lot of the work offsite and then save your money for that one or two days you need on the stage when you have to, you know, have a room full of clients and everybody has to, you know, come in and, and do a big review. So I think that's a really great way to really stretch a client's budget. So we've got a couple questions from our audience today. Thank you so one, much, one, guys. One, oh, one go thing, ahead. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Go the, ahead, one thing I, the, the one thing I would say for the uh, younger people in the audience, if you do this stuff at home and stuff like that, and I know these guys are doing this, but you know, you, you are worth a certain amount of money and you have equipment at your home that's worth a certain amount of money. So although it is saving, you shouldn't give it to them for ten dollars. Your worth is is it doesn't matter if you're on a big stage at Sony or Warner Brothers or Universal or you're in your garage, you're still worth the same amount. So just make sure that you take care of yourself. I heard somebody uh, say the other day that when a when a when they are asking for determining the rate for a project that they need to continue to remind themselves that they're not just paying for the moments that they need on on that person's project they're paying for the investment of their skills to be able to apply that to the project so there's a uh, a cost of the investment that you've put in in yourself as an audio mixer in order to be able to apply those skills I think Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really like the, important. It's yeah. like the story of the plumber that some guy calls a plumber and he says something's wrong. Something's wrong with this water heater. He takes out a hammer, goes, bing, fixes it. The guy says, I'm paying you $150 for that. He says, no, you're paying me $150 for my 20 years of experience that told me which hammer to use and where to hit it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Exactly. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's take a couple questions from our audience real quick. We're, we're starting to come to the end of time so quickly. Um, uh, Catherine Korno, uh, Korniloff, excuse me, Korniloff, um, is the decision to go single mixer always driven by budget or are there some creative preferences to it? She's hearing that it sounds like working with others is typically preferred. Is there a situation where it's creatively preferred? Yeah, I would say yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of my clients prefer just a single mixer. Um, and, and that is a lot in part because uh, being, again, mostly animation, they've made a lot of choices and decisions months before um, and so we're not making as many uh, decisions at, in the mix time. Like we've, it, it, because of the nature of animation, everybody spent months thinking about how every single one of these gags lines up and plays um, so that we don't have to sit there and think about, well, should we play it like this or should we play it like that? Or, um, you know, is this idea sort of working here? Um, so that sort of stuff gets flushed out a lot sooner um, before we actually mix in, in a lot of animated type stuff, especially on Family Guy and American Dad. So, I had a big um, a, a CGI heavy project, very action oriented, superhero y type thing. And that ended up being divided into kind of a uh, multiple mixers working on individual episodes. So it was a single mixer project. And that didn't suffer from budget at all, but it did suffer from a lot of conforms and a lot of updates as a result of the graphics. So what they did is they put two mixers on it, hired two mixers and put them in two separate rooms and let them focus on one individual episode. And then they compared continuously for consistency, but it took away basically the complexity of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sound design tracks and vocal processing, et cetera, that needed to be constantly conformed as the picture changed. So that 
that's probably a creative example, I would think. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Say. Yeah. Or the other yeah, the so other thing that is that that happens is is and this if if you wind up having clients from back in the day that you mm -hmm. start that you started out when I was when I was a, just a single single mixer, uh, I've got a few of these clients that they just want me. And that's, mm -hmm. they said, no, 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 we don't need more people. You're, you're our guy and, and that'll be fine. So mm -hmm. that is fine. Yeah, that is fine. Yeah. You have a relationship. Whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a, a question from Robert Frank. Robert Frank has a, 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 a more general question for us. Uh, he's coming from a music background and with so many different powerful DAWs available, um, he, uh, he, he begs our forgiveness. He's like, forgive me for my ignorance. Very sweet. Um, he says, is Pro Tools still the default DAW for uh, TV and film or are, mix are mixers exploring other options such as uh, Fairlight? So what do you guys think? I think Pro Tools Pro is still Tools. Thing, right? Yeah, it's everything. Tools, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would say, and it's. I think it's getting more dynamic too. You can use it in more and more different ways. Um, but I would still say Pro Tools. Yeah, it's in every. It's in on every stage you'll ever go on. It's also a delivery requirement in a lot of cases. So yeah. uh, it, it is written into the standard of what you have to deliver at the end is a Pro Tools mm -hmm. session. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think so. Pro Excellent. Tools. And actually, oh, my friend Nicole Fletcher is here. Hello, Nicole. Hey, girl, how you doing? Um, she says, there, is there any etiquette, broad or specific, you wish you'd known before going into a two-person mix for the very first time? Oh, that is the money question, Nicole. That's the money question right there. That's excellent. I don't know why I didn't ask you guys that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Rule one, don't press this. If you're an effects mixer, don't press the space bar. Someone has to guide the ship. Because you will all, yeah. <laughs> and you will always press the space bar. Yeah. And then you go, crap, sorry. Well, I, <laughs> we do, we do sort of generally establish a sort of like nod of like, you're driving or I'm driving. Yeah. And whoever, whoever is the person sort of driving at that point, then yeah, you don't get in their way and you just sort of do whatever you can around what they're doing at the time. Um, yeah. So there is, there is, it, it. It's, it takes a certain amount of practice to get into that, especially if you've never done it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also say there's an etiquette to delivering the feedback to one another when clients are in the room that something is working or not working. There's a, you know, like, like oftentimes when I'm working closely with people for a while, I'd be like, oh, I really like what you did there. And you point to the thing that they're not focusing on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, you know, that is a really cool thing there. Or, or oftentimes I had a, a, a mixed partner that was really excellent where they, if they saw me, um, uh, like, you know, a line getting lost or it's something they'd be like, oh, um, you know, uh, 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 can can you play that line for me again? I just want to adjust something here on my backgrounds. And it would like, bring my attention to that line. And then we would focus on that one thing. And I'd be like, and later on, I'd be like, yeah, thanks a lot, man. Yeah, you're right. We were totally losing that. Or we were totally, like, there, inst there tends to be, at least in my world, I noticed when you work with people for a while, there tends to be like a, uh, an etiquette into how to kind of save each other, you know, <laughs> in, in a diplomatic fashion while you're presenting that you're both, incredibly competent and, and working towards serving the picture. Well, there's, there's also know? a hierarchy too, to, to, to respect. And usually the, the, the dialogue and mix music mixer is the lead mixer. And usually they are the ones talking mostly to the client. Uh, you don't want to disagree with them, certainly with the client in the room, or, I mean, cause I worked for years with a mixer who, you know, as hard as it is to say, did not like RX didn't like RX. And he'd go through all sorts of gesticulations with other products and all. And I just sat back. It's like, you know what? It's his show. And if he wants me to help him with something, I will do that. Uh, but it's definitely, it, it's, it sounds, you know, you just got to kind of know where you stand. And then there are times when, you know, you can make all the clients laugh and that's really fun. Uh, but, you know, the, the ship can have one captain. Indeed.
Um, so uh, uh, we have a question here um, from Catherine uh, Kornilov. Um, she says, please say more about how you might bid on an indie project for your home studio. Do you use a formula such as X hours per finished minute of runtime, or do you run that formula for each process, this much for dialogue edit, this much for sound effects, this much for ADR, this much for Foley? That like, is there a, is there a formula? I, I, I think that on an indie project, the only number that matters is is what number they have available, because at mm -hmm. some at some point yeah. you can tell them any number you like, but if that's if they don't have that number, it, then it's yeah. a completely moot point. You have to make a decision whether you're going to do it for the number or whether you're not, or, or whether you just don't think it can be done. And then if you decide you're doing it for the number, then you have to start having these questions about well, are we going to go? do a playback in a bigger room, what's that going to cost, all the rest of it, and figure out whether that's possible. But ultimately, indie projects, it's the number. It's whether you yeah. can whether you can just get it done for that number. For me, it's also, is it the passion too? Because like, if you have a, you know, do you want to do this project? Are you in love with this project? Do you feel like you can really serve this project? Is this going to fill your cup of passion? If it's going to fill your cup of passion, I'm not going to say I'm going to give my skills away for free because that's just not fair to the marketplace and it's shooting myself in the foot. But, uh, but there is, there are concessions that you can make if you really want to, if you see a connection with something versus if you're doing something as a, a, a project that you'll know that you'll do a good job, but it's not, it doesn't speak to you on an internal level, then, uh, you know, that's a, that's a more cut and dry equation, you know? All those different things that, that, that she mentioned are also, I don't want to say bargaining chips, but if they only have this number, you say, okay, well then let's take Foley off the table. We'll, right. we'll go with production effects. Right. Uh, you know, how much ADR do you want to do? Okay, we can afford one day mm -hmm. of ADR. Yeah, and which so, area do you care the most about? Yeah. Yeah, and and, and and to just to just put limits. In other words, you've got a number. So one thing you know right off the bat is, well, we cannot spend longer than this amount of time mixing it, and we have to work out how to be able mm -hmm. to do that. Um, right. And that, and I think holding that line is very important with a client, establishing, yeah. you know, upfront what's going to happen if they want to go over that. Right. You know. Yeah, I always say contracts are, are make keep friends. Contracts keep friends. You know what I mean? Because you know, you, you know what I mean. It sounds like you in, in the beginning. You're like, well, let's make a contract and write it all down. It sounds very formal, but in fact, contracts keep friends because it can, then, and it can and know. it can just be an email with with the deal mm -hmm. point. Like, you know, yeah, we're going to do this many days for this amount of money, and at the end, we're delivering in this format. You know, mm -hmm. um, and it's tough. I think we have uh, two little tiny questions, and then I think we're probably coming to the end of our our our, our presentation here. Um, so, uh, Eric Cross, does file management change at all between solo and multi mixer projects? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Different it's machines. A, yeah, it's a bigger pile of hay for sure, <laughs> right? <laughs> My yeah. multi mixer project, you also probably have a mix tech as well. Mm -hmm. In so now it's not just two mixers, but it's two mixers plus another person who's also keeping you straight and handling all of that. Mm -hmm. That's true. I would say though, on average, I get hours back per day by having a mix tech, like a really competent mix tech oh, yeah. who is managing the updates, looking at the emails. Like for all the clients out there who are watching right now, if you're sending me an email while I'm mixing, that means I'm reading your email and I'm not mixing. If that is your information. <laughs> If I have a mix tech and I'm in a larger environment, that person does that and they can go, oh, 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 this is important. You actually need to stop and listen to this. This is a thing. Or keep going, keep going. And they keep that room rolling. That's that's an important, important thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As someone who doesn't usually have a mix tech, uh, many, many times I really, really wish we did. <laughs> Yeah, God bless, you know, God bless. And that um, is one of the solo mixer things, right? It makes you be your own mix tech. Yes. Yeah. But it's both good and bad. I mean, it, it's definitely good for you, but it's also a, a, a ton of extra work as well. It's a lot of extra work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, it, you're, I'm less reliant on uh, the stage engineers, you know, uh, when I'm in a room. So most yeah. of the time I can fly solo without having to, you know, call in uh, tech support every, you know, 
five minutes or so. Matt, do you get a mix tech on your single mix projects or no? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God I, bless you. <laughs> I will not, especially, I mean, I won't do it. I, I won't do it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But especially when it comes to a single person, like a lot of times I'll do, uh, it's really becoming commonplace where I'll do single person tent mixes now. And, uh, and I remember one time the company said, oh, uh, yeah, can you do it without a mix tech? I said, you're crazy on a single mix. I, this was an action movie. I was flying by the seat of my pants. And then when we go from one reel to another, uh, the, uh, since it's just a Pro Tools session, the mix deck had it up in like a minute and a half. And I looked at him. I brought him to the side of the room. I go, hey, man, it takes 10 minutes to change a reel from here on out. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so went, I finished the reel. And, he go, and then I go, okay, guys, it'll be about 10 minutes. And I looked at the yeah. mix deck and I walked out of the room. Yeah. I just did. And plus, when you're a single person, I can't say this enough again, is that is a time for that 10 minutes that I could uh, engage the client. Because when I'm mm -hmm. busting a butt, the, I need mm -hmm. to see the back of my head and I can tell you right now, I've worked with fabulous mixers who uh, don't, uh, who are technically inclined, but they don't engage the clients and they don't work as much. So it is so important to have them enjoy their space with you. And if you don't have a mix tech, you are not accomplishing that task. And that is a big task on a, on a mix tech. It just is. That is so true. I, I'm reminded of, uh, of one time I heard Randy Tom speak and he addressed the audience and he said, over all of your clients out there who, uh, you know, you haven't seen me in a while, it, it's me. And then he did yeah, like this. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't get that engagement. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, we have another question, Tim Boland. Uh, what percentage are you mixing projects that are 5-1, uh, 7-1, Atmos, Stereo? What's the formats that, what flavors are you guys so uh, working with these days. I'm almost uh, all Atmos. Yeah. Yeah, it's mainly it's mainly Atmos. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are five one, I'll do in seven one. <laughs> and then just do a down cover. There's no way I'm not mixing in seven one. Because when yeah. they come back and they want Atmos, then you're most of the way there. And and yeah, nothing uh, is absolutely. nothing is just stereo, right? Mm -hmm. I, no, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't get, I gotten hired for stereo in a long time. Although, ironically, because after COVID, so many people are approving things in stereo, which is crazy heartbreaking. But yeah, that's not mixed that way. Uh, Sean, for animation, what what are they asking for mostly? Uh, it was still five one. Um, five I don't one. see animation moving to at least like series animation moving anytime soon uh well depending on the series i mean i think there's some netflix shows that um i think could go that way um i actually did um when i did masters universe the reboot um i did it in seven one actually thinking that we were going to get halfway through this and they were going to go oh we should do this in atmos so i tried to future proof myself and then we never did it but so mm -hmm. maybe someday. Um, so close. So close. <laughs> but um, for, you know, my network shows, it, it's it's five one. And honestly, my clients are still watching in stereo. And I think, you know, for the genre that I'm working in, a lot of times people are watching on their phones still. So it's still mm -hmm. critical to be your that stereo is still really critical. So uh, on, on Midnight mm -hmm. Mass, I was I was mixing in Atmos in here and they were approving in stereo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed. But that's also yeah, where our trust know. comes in. Yeah, and even though you mix on Atmos, you know, I still will uh, check the stereo for sure. Anything that's going Absolutely. broadcast, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have uh, one last question, and I think uh, we are wrapping. We have, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, and I apologize, Derek. Derek Duvenger? Du Duverger? Duverger. I'm, I'm really bad at that. Um, and I'm like an Ely Namiotka too. I have no excuse. Um, so uh, what is your favorite metering plugin when gauging the master level loudness, you know, i.e. Luffs? New, new Gen Visual M. Mm. Second, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's the big that's one. Yeah. However, oh. I do use um, uh, Waves uh, and uh, the Isotope. Uh, one Insight, and there's one from Yulene. And a lot of times we'll have them all up, and whichever number is the one the client wants, that's the one I use. <laughs> well, and for a dialogue level, I, I have 
I have a TC clarity meter here with the with mm -hmm. the radar display. So like when it's in the middle at the top, it's at minus 27, which is Netflix sort of dial. Mm -hmm. And I'll just mm -hmm. keep that roughly in my mind. But but VizLM and the real reason is because if you make updates, then they're automatically incorporated into the into the thing. Yes. And you, you can just graphically see over the whole thing where you're going wrong. I have a tend to locally use um, Insight if I'm using it, if I'm doing a spec I'm not used to, and then assign my buses to different colors on Insight. But um, I always use the VizLM on the recorder because that will give me the overall if we're in the ballpark or if we're not in the ballpark, whereas Insight will easily tell me, especially if I have a wacky spec, like something that's not dialogue weighted or something that's <laughs> like something kind of funky that I got to deal with that I'm not, you know, that haven't touched in a little while, I'll be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll use this because it'll tell me who the culprit is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of places are QCing and using VizLM or the algorithm, at least that's in the VizLM as well. And so I know that using the waves loudness meter, sometimes if you're pushing the edge of your spec, sometimes, um, you can be off with that. So, and the spec uh, has tolerance. There's like yeah. 0.3 dBs of tolerance in the spec. So you have, and the new gen at least is going to be the more conservative. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of go with the more conservative number um, in order to make sure you hit, you hit spec. Indeed. My goodness. But I would also say mix with your ears first. And, and, you know, and just monitor properly. And then you usually find that the pressure level will put you really close to spec, if not there. Yeah. When you say, or yeah, yeah. And so it's monitoring really. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of that comes down to the comfort level of what level do you like to monitor at? That is true. That is solid. Yes. It's also room dependent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's true. If I'm monitoring a funky level, I will find myself mixing for that comfortable pressure and it will change. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Well, I think that is all the time we have for today, everybody. I am so blessed to have all of you here, your expertise and your time. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand you. this back over to Wendy. Um, thank you, Wendy, too. Yeah. Cheers. Oh gosh, you guys, that was amazing. And I, I think there's somebody here. Derek, I'm going to read Derek because it's true. This panel was very informative and entertaining, honored to be soaking in valuable wisdom. So a huge thank you to you guys. Fantastic. Thank you, Sean, Bob, Carol, Jonathan, and Matt. Um, I hope we can do part two sometime because I, I think there's so much more we can be talking about. So we'll have to think about that in the future. But I appreciate you guys making time. Thank you so much. It is time again. We have traveled uh, all the way around to December again for our 12th annual LAPPG food drive. Uh, we do this obviously every year. We used to do it in person um, and we used to bring cans. But remember, we used to bring bags and bags of cans and people were so generous. And then we slept these giant barrels across the street to the West Side Food Bank. And I, I do miss that because that was super fun. And we would do a big raffle with all that. But since we're meeting virtually now, we want to still be able to support the food bank. So we are asking if you have the ability to help um, those struggling with food insecurity this holiday season and beyond, um, if you would donate, uh, donate what you can. And a huge welcome to Shift Media. They are a new Silver Level partner. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but Shift Media um, for more than two decades have helped address complex production challenges for the world's most recognizable names in entertainment and advertising. Media Silo is their premier platform for presenting, organizing, and securing your best work. And to learn more about this all-in-one platform uh, for video teams, head to shiftmedia.io. We are thrilled to have them on board supporting LAPPG. And uh, it's it's great to, to be able to enlarge our family even more. So we thank them for coming aboard. And we want to make sure you connect with us. Be sure to go on uh, Facebook. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Use hashtag LAPPG. 
And a huge thank you to our partners, AJA at the platinum level, at the gold level, Adobe, Blackmagic Design, OWC, Zeiss, and Frame.io. Also at the silver level, Isotope, SGO, Media Silo by Shift Media, Small HD, and Terra Deck. And we have lots of support from the community, from media, and from our other supporters. So um, be sure if you can, uh, if you see them out in the community to thank them for supporting LAPPG, for helping get the word out. Uh, it does take a village. So we hope to see you next year. And thank you all again. And bye-bye. Uh, take care. Happy, Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Have a great new year. Thank you.